Hey guys, um, I wanted to get on here and do a video about Jordy's birth story. I was working on her um, baby book and it asks to write her birth story. So as I was writing it, I thought it would be a good idea to make a video just to let everybody know who's been following our story. And also, so it's like a memory that I have and I can put on our YouTube channel, show Jordy one day and just have for myself to look back on. I think with time, memories fade and sometimes it's nice to uh, look back in you know, remember exactly what happened because as time goes on, things seem to just get kind of blurred together. And I think the more and more I tell this story, it seems to do that. So in order to tell the story, we have to back up a little bit. Most people know that we struggled with infertility and uh, we ended up doing IVF in 2021. The first embryo transfer we had resulted in a miscarriage. And then the second embryo transfer was Jordy, which was successful. Uh, in the beginning of our pregnancy, we saw our fertility doctor, but after like eight weeks, we were uh, transferred to our regular OB and we were just like a regular pregnant. I was just a regular pregnant patient at that point. The only difference was that our doctor did ask for us to do a level two sonogram at Medical City, Dallas uh, when I was about 20 weeks. So we went to that appointment and we also had a fetal echo done of her heart. So we got to see her heart, we got to see the blood flowing through all the chambers of the heart. Everything looked great with Jordy. Um, we saw the specialist there and he said everything looked great with her. He wasn't worried about anything. Um, but he said, did anyone tell you where your placenta was? And I said, no. And he said, you have complete placenta previa. Your placenta is covering your cervix and the baby has no way to come out. So you would have to have a C-section, but it's likely that it would resolve. Most people's resolves as time goes on in the pregnancy. So. I did have a lot more sonograms than normal uh, to try to keep watching it. At 24 weeks, it had still not moved. Uh, part of having placenta previa, I was on pelvic rest. I couldn't lift more than 10 pounds. I couldn't work out and do like strenuous activity other than just like walking and like really light stuff. Um, and I was at risk for having a bleed, which if I had a bleed, I would need to go to the emergency room. It's an emergency. So uh, that was scary. Uh, you know, I had a lot of fear about that. I had a lot of anxiety about it, but I had talked to so many people who said that their placentas did resolve. So I was really hopeful. Well, on uh, February 27th, my grandma passed away. And uh, on Monday morning, that was on a Saturday night, Monday morning we went to a sonogram and miraculously my placenta had moved. It was now low lying placenta. It was still very low, but it had moved away from the cervix. So. I was able to fly home for my grandma's funeral, which was really special for me to be able to do. And um, they would continue to watch the placenta, but it wasn't you know, the high risk that it was before. So at our next appointment, uh, we found out that Jordy was breached. So her head was up and also her feet were up. She was like in a little pancake. She was like in a little V in there with her head and her feet on the top of my belly. And you know, babies need to be turning head down as you get closer to delivery. So they would keep watching it to see if she had moved um, as time went on. And uh, unfortunately she didn't move. Every appointment she was still in the same exact spot. And they said, you know, it was looking again like a C-section. So I was fine with that. I just wanted to bring Jordy here the safest way for me and her. And so I had no problem with having a C-section. You know, it wasn't my first choice, but my first choice is for me and Jordy to be healthy. So. If that's what my doctor, who we trusted, said we needed to do, then that's what we were gonna do. And um, they did offer to do a version, which is where they try to turn her manually from the outside, but I didn't feel called to do a version. Um, I would later understand why, but I, at the time, just didn't feel called to do that. So our C-section was scheduled. I was 39 weeks and four days. It was on May 26th, and we went in to Baylor McKinney at 11.30 in the morning to do pre-op the C-section would be at 1.30. So we went in, everything was great. I got the IV, we had some blood work done. They later brought me into the OR and did a spinal block. And then Eric joined us in the OR. Um, I had made a Spotify playlist, everything was going great. Uh, the doctors and nurses loved the playlist. I had Halo by Beyonce, I had Lauren Daigle, a bunch of songs that had been really special to me um, during like our infertility journey and also during my pregnancy with Jordy and just songs that really gotten me through like the hard times. So that was going great. Marty was our CRNA. Um, he is a friend of a friend of ours 
who worked with him at Baylor. And so we felt like we were in great hands. Uh, he was updating us as things started. Um, he said, you know, they made the cut, um, her butt is out, her legs are out, things like that. He was telling us every step of the way. And all of a sudden he quit updating us. So Eric was like, what's going on? Um, you know, what's happening? And he kept kind of looking over and then he realized that she was stuck. Her head, her, they couldn't get her head out. So our doctor had called some kind of code. Several people came into the, into more people came into the OR. Her and the other surgeon were pouncing on my belly and trying to get Jordy unstuck. Finally, they were able to get her out. Um, I was super calm at this point. I knew that they would get her out. I, I'm, they got to get them somehow or another. They're going to get her out, you know? So I don't know if it was the drugs that they had me on, but I was super calm at this point. Uh, they finally get her out and my doctor yells, Oh my God, she's a big girl. And Marty said, did you know you were going to have a big baby? And I said, oh, yeah, I think she's going to be like over eight pounds or so. And he's like, no, like she's really big. So they were all taking bets on how big she was. I still didn't see her at this point. So I, um, wasn't aware of how large she was so uh she didn't cry at first and that's normal I had told Eric that happens so he was a little nervous but he finally you know we both heard her cry and uh from across the room and he was able to go over there and see her and then they brought her over and laid her on top of me and I was able to see her for a few minutes and we got pictures with our doctor Sarah Nay, me and Eric me and her everything seemed to be going well while they were stitching me up um, but it did start to feel like it, it was taking a while. Um, it started to feel like they had said I'd be in there 30 to 45 minutes. There was a big clock on the wall and I could see that I was in there a lot longer. So I was a little nervous, but nobody was really saying what was going on. So I didn't know for sure what was happening. Um, I did, there is a big stainless steel light at the top above the OR table. And I looked into the light, you can see the reflection and I could see that there were tubes coming out of me. And if you're grossed out, you should probably stop watching this video if you're easily grossed out by stuff. But I could see these tubes coming out of me and I thought, hmm, that's weird, but nobody was really saying what, had, what it was. So we finally made it to the recovery right outside the OR and uh, everything seemed to be going fine in recovery um, until I didn't, I started to not feel well. And I told our nurse, hey, I don't feel good. I feel like I'm gonna throw up. I feel like I am fading. I feel like I'm gonna pass out. And so she came over and she hit my blood pressure cuff and my blood pressure was super low. So she calls back Marty. Marty puts something in my IV and, or gives me a shot of something, I don't know, whatever. And it, next two readings, my blood pressure is back to ish normal. I mean, it's like low, but not like extremely low. So, okay. Then it happens again. He comes back in again, gives me something else. And, you know, it's it worked for like a couple minutes. And then the third time, by the third time this happened, they called everybody back. They were like, something's not right. They called my doctor, the anesthesiologist, another surgeon, like four more nurses, Marty. They called everybody back in. Everybody's standing around me trying to figure out what's happening. Um, they're picking up these tubes that are coming out of the bottom out of me and they're looking and what they realized is that there's a clot in this in these suction tubes that are coming out well what had happened is in the OR your uterus has to contract after you have a baby if it doesn't it's called uterine atony and they can give you multiple medications to try to make the uterus contract and stop the blood flow well my I was not responding to any of the medications that they gave me. So they put this device inside my uterus called a Jada. It's new. I don't know a lot about it, but from what I understand, it makes your uterus contract or like simulate, I don't know, does something like that. And there's suction that comes out of it. Uh, well, what happened, because there was a big clot in this suction, it wasn't doing what it was needing to do. So they got all the tubing switched out and, and they realized that I had lost a lot of blood. I'd lost 40% of my blood. Um, because it wasn't, you know, properly suctioning, I guess, plus whatever had lost in the OR. So they called the blood bank and uh, ordered or ordered blood. So I knew the blood was on the way. My doctor was holding my hand uh, between him or my nurse or the uh, CRNA. Somebody was always holding my hand. At this point, I had I knew what was going on because I had researched this all when I had placenta previa. So I knew about postpartum hemorrhages, and I was starting to get really upset. I was crying. Um, they told me that if this didn't work, they would have to go back in the OR and do a hysterectomy and take my uterus. That was really hard to hear, um, but I wanted to do whatever was safest for me and 
So, you know, I was willing to do whatever needed to be done. I kept asking, when would the blood be there? I knew I needed it. I knew how important it was and I knew I didn't feel good. So it was, you know, I was like, when is it going to be here? And they would just say, it's on its way. It's on its way. It's on its way. And it felt like forever, even though it was probably just a few minutes. But it finally got there and they gave me four bags. And I took the bags in like a minute. And so I started to feel a little bit better after that. Uh, at the worst, my blood pressure was 69 over 33. And your normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. And my resting heart rate was 165, which is like me running a 5K. So I knew this, both of those numbers, because I am very aware of what my blood pressure is all the time. And I'm very aware of what my heart rate is from working out. So I, and I'm not like a medical person, but I knew that these were not good numbers. So um, after I got the transfusion, I started to do better and they watched me for a few more hours and we didn't leave recovery until 10 or 11 p.m. This whole entire day that I was there, like 11 plus hours um, before I even got to my, got to like our room, um, it felt like 30 minutes. It felt like everything just happened so fast, but I know it didn't. I know it took like all day, but this, it was, I don't know if it's because it was traumatic or the medication or what, but it just, it felt like everything happened really fast. So we finally made it to our room and I was really weak. I could barely hold Jordy. I couldn't open my eyes. I, Eric had to do every feed, every diaper change, everything. I couldn't, I, yeah, it was horrible. Um, the next day it was the same thing that was on a Friday. And then on Saturday morning, day three, they did my blood work again and my hemoglobin had dropped again and I needed another transfusion. So they did another bag, just one bag this time. Uh, so that's five bags total. And um, this one was slower. Uh, it took several hours to get this transfusion done. They also gave me Benadryl, which makes me really drowsy. So I was like a zombie that morning when I got the, that transfusion. And then later that day, they were like, hey, time to get up and you need to get going, moving around. And this was like, oh my God, are you kidding? I'd been laying in a bed for two days. So, but I did, I, I was finally able to get up and had to do what I had to do to try to be able to go home. And so on the fourth day, we were able to, to go home on the night, um, that Sunday night. The doctor that discharged us came in and told me that if I would have had this baby at home, I would have died, which is why you have a baby at a hospital. That's what she told me. And that was hard to hear. I mean, I knew that was the case, but it was still hard for somebody to tell you that you would have died or if this was, you know, X amount of years ago or if they didn't have this device. Um, you know, all those things go through your mind of what would have happened. So, you know, it was really traumatic, but we have Jordy. She was doing amazing. She was thriving through this whole entire thing. Eric was awesome. He was stepped up as like best dad ever and he had to help me and then, you know, when we went home, it was really hard for the first couple of weeks. It was a lot harder than we had anticipated it would be because of the complications. And I was so weak, but, you know, every day I got stronger and every day um, got a little bit easier. So here we are. It's been over two months. Jordy's doing great. I'm doing great. We're just really thankful to, you know, for us all three to be healthy and to be doing so well. And we're thankful for all of our friends and family for the support that people gave us after this. Um, so many people brought us meals, brought us gifts, did different things for us that helped us, came to visit us, stay with us. My cousin Cassandra, my aunt, Le aunt my aunt Lisa, um, different people, tons of different of our friends came and just supported us in so many ways that was amazing. We don't have a lot of friends or family in Texas. We have lots of friends and we don't have a lot of family. So it was really, really nice to, uh, have everybody support us. And we just love everybody so much. We love Jordy and we hope one day that we will maybe be able to do this again, but we have to do what, what's best for, you know, we have to do what's healthy. So we will see what the future holds, but for now that's Jordy's birth story. And it was, <laughs> it was scary and it was traumatic and it's something that I think that will be a struggle for me for a while. Um, but so many people I've talked to have had also, you know, I've talked to a lot of other people who've had traumatic birth stories and I think it's something we don't talk about enough that 
birth can be very can be the best day of your life and in some ways for me it was the best day because it was the day that Jordy got here but it was also simultaneously the scariest day of my life so it's gonna be it's hard it's hard to like move past that trauma um but I just look at her every day and I know that God was taking care of both of us and he was taking care of us the whole entire time there was a reason why I had all of those things there was a reason why we had the baby at this hospital there was a reason why you know all of these things happen and I know that you know I was saved so I don't take that lightly and I know that I just thank God every day for our miracle and for every day for me being here safe. So love y'all.